Skipper stole his first buddy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma, pig slopping, in 46. Oh, every Christmas we visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Jeans and ExtremeJeans.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this episode is brought to you by BYU TV's Relative Race. The final episode for this season is coming up this weekend, Sunday night, 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific. And uh, we've got some great guests today. First of all, we're going to talk to Jim Beidler coming up in about 10 minutes. He's from Legacy Tree Genealogist. And he's going to talk about the problem of figuring out who people are when they share the same names and the same dates and the same places. And, you know, a lot of people deal with this issue. So we'll have that coming up in just a little bit. And then later in the show, we have a woman, an ordinary person with an extraordinary find. And that is that she descends from the first hired killer in the history of New York State. Who was he? What was his story? How did she find it? You'll have that later on in the show. And just a reminder, if you haven't signed up, for our weekly Genie newsletter yet, we would love to invite you to do so at ExtremeGenes.com and through our Facebook page. We've got lots of links to great stories and past and current episodes of Extreme Genes and my weekly blog, so check it out. Right now, let's head out to Boston and talk to David Allen Lambert, the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. How are you, David? I'm doing great, except for all these leaves I've been raking up. Yeah, I've got that problem, too. Fortunately, I have a riding lawnmower, and it sucks up the leaves, so it's a lot better than raking. Well, you head down to Massachusetts, and you bring that riding lawnmower. (laughs) We'll do the show on the road. (laughs) Take care of these leaves for me. Sounds like fun. I'd like to start off this week's stories with one that I can share that came to me. Really? I got a little box in the mail, yeah. Anniversary of World War One, the armistice. One of my dear friends, his dad was in World War One, and he had sent me a match safe that was made from a bent German World War One belt buckle that you'd put like a box of matches in. I thought that was neat. Wow. Well, he found something else. This is a chain that on it has a compass made in Germany. Could have been before the war. It has in it a plastic whistle, which apparently they've been making them since the turn of the century, the previous century, of course. And there's also something I couldn't recognize. So I took the name off of it. It said Marbles in Michigan, 1900. And I said, was it a marble holder? No, it was a match safe to keep your matches dry. Wow. And if this guy's up in a signal balloon in World War One, I, I can understand why there might be some foul weather, why he'd need a compass and a whistle. So right? the best part of this, I'm getting something brought by train this week. It's a German artillery shell his father picked up. Are we sure it's no longer live after 100 years? I think it's in two parts, and apparently the gunpowder is completely out of it. Wow. It will make an interesting desk toy, I can tell you that much. A lot of conversations <laughs> yeah, right? when people say, this is the complaint department. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to our family histoire news today here, David. What else do you have? Well, you know, speaking of World War One, there's a great story on extreme genes about the stories of those family members who lost a loved one in World War One, and talking about them a century later. Because, I mean, genealogists and family historians long will remember these people and with their efforts to preserve them and give these stories out, they will live even longer. That's right. And if you're curious about researching your World War One veteran, check out our friend Amy Johnson Crow's website at amyjohnsoncrow.com, where she interviewed me recently on how to find your World War One ancestors. It's not too late to remember them, even though it was 100 years ago that they served. Yep, this month. Well, they've done it again, Fish. Another cold case, this one in Florida, cracked thanks to DNA and genealogy. And of course, our friends at jedmatch.com that have that database that Law enforcement, send a sample in, and voila. Yeah, there's the family. You know, it's funny, because these things go on for 20, 30 years, and you think of the taxpayer dollars spent by these law enforcement people to try to solve these cases, and with genetic genealogy and DNA, often they solve them over the course of a week or two, and that's it. 
It really is crazy. And I'll tell you, it was three members of his family that submitted DNA. So I guess my advice out there is if you think your cousin has killed somebody, lend a little spit to Jed Match and see if you can't catch a killer. That's wow. crazy. Yeah. Well, the next thing I want to share is a story about longevity. For a long time, people have thought, well, you inherit it from your parents because they live to be 100 and all that. Well, they're saying now that genetics may not have a lot to do with it. A statistical analysis of all these parameters revealed that longevity in genes were linked in less than 20 to 30 percent for some cases, and in some cases, 15 percent for relatives of a different gender. Wow. So it just doesn't much matter. I just made a death chart for myself and my wife, you know, going back to second grades on both sides, how long people lived and what they died of. And now you're telling me it was a complete waste of time. Well, I don't know, but maybe we could pull in one of our friends like C.C. Moore or Blaine Bettinger or Angie Bush to uh, give their opinion on this story. Yeah. Because they are the real experts in the field. That is true. Well, genealogy is great when you can find ancestors, but when you can find siblings, even better. Two sisters that were separated 75 years ago during World War II from Russia have now connected. One that lives in the United States and one who lives in Finland. So Tamara Terachow and her sister Lydia, who lives in Finland, have now connected after seven and a half decades. Wow. Isn't that something? And, and I guess they're not in the greatest of health, but they're talking all the time and And if you read this story on ExtremeGenes.com, you'll see that their background as children trying to survive the war was absolutely incredible. And now here it is all these decades later, and they've found each other again. It's wonderful to see people reunite before it's too late. Yep. Well, I would like to share with you my blogger spotlight. John Grenham, who many of you know if you've done Irish research, has a blog at johngrenham.com slash blog. And we've talked fish recently about the Spanish flu, and he talks about how the Spanish flu affects Irish family history. He has a great blog, and there are about recent maps that are available on Ireland, the Scotch-Irish research that people have done, as well as the deteriorating records of Irish parishes. And some are online, but some haven't even been digitized. Yet. Oh, boy. Well, that's all I have from Beantown this week, Fish. But I do want to say, if you're not a member of American Ancestors and you're listening, remember you can use the coupon code EXTREME on AmericanAncestors.org and save $20 on membership. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. We'll catch you again next week. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Jim Beidler from Legacy Tree Genealogist about separating people of the same names in the same places as you do your research. It's, it's tricky work, but he's got some great tips. It's all coming up on Extreme Genes. America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher, and keep those pictures coming. Those befores and afters using the Vivid Pics Fix with Restore, their special software that will restore your photographs with just one click of a button. It is so easy. No learning complicated software, just the click of one button, and you'll get actually nine choices to choose from. And you can see the results of other people at ExtremeGenes.com. Then go to vivid-pics.com slash ExtremeGenes and test it for yourself using 10 of your favorite photographs. Make a photo that you just can't throw away. Turn into something that you're ready to frame again. It's that good. Go to vivid-pics.com slash extreme genes or link to it through extremegenes.com. Try it yourself for free using Rick and Randy's special software, Restore, at vivid-pics.com slash extreme genes. And by the way, if you prefer complicated, Restore from Vivid Pics is not for you. You. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom centers. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today.
Well, Genies, we are down to the final day on BYU TV's Relative Race. And if you didn't catch Day 9 this past weekend, I can tell you one team was eliminated and only two teams remain for the final day. And they went all over the country. Kima, Texas, North Bergen, New Jersey, Louisville, Kentucky. And this was perhaps the most emotional episode of the entire season, where one participant actually got to see her father and her grandmother for the first time in 23 years. Oh, you're going to need a clean next for this one, no doubt about it. You can stream it, of course, on BYUtv.org or through your BYU TV app. It's absolutely free. And then this weekend, the final question will be answered. Who is going to win the $50,000? It's all going to take place in one location, and it's going to be a lot of fun, so make sure you catch it. That's Sunday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific on BYU TV. Watch it live or stream it. It's BYU TV's Relative Race, the final day. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, with my guest Jim Beidler with Legacy Tree Genealogists. He is a research reports editor located in Reading, Pennsylvania, at least in the neighborhood, right, Jim? That's right, yes. I actually live in Burn Township, which is a few miles outside of Reading. Got it. Well, it's nice to have you on the show, and uh, I'm very excited about this little blog you've written here recently for something that I would call the John Smith Syndrome. This is where people get into their research, and they realize that there are just so many people of the same very, very common name, and how do they figure out which one is theirs? And you've done an excellent little column about this and thought we would kick this around today. Have you run into this in your own research a little bit? Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't even have to be terribly common names. There are times when there are two people of an identical name yep. or nearly identical name that isn't so common, but you want to avoid conflating the two so that you are researching the ones related to your ancestor and not just someone of the same name. And it gets complicated, too, when you see other people online, maybe on Ancestry or My Heritage, where they've kind of merged two people into one, and it gets real complicated, and you think, are they right? You know, so many people love to just copy what other people do instead of trying to sort it out. So this is really important. I myself have a great-grandfather, Andrew Jackson Fisher, who lived in the 10th Ward of New York City in the middle of the 1800s. Well, there was another Andrew Jackson Fisher who lived in the middle of the 10th Ward in the middle of the 1850s, and he, too, was a volunteer fireman at that time. So I had to go to a lot of effort to make sure I was looking at the right person as I did my research on my guy and made sure I wasn't confusing newspaper stories and other sources with the other guy. That's an excellent point. And, yeah, that's what we try to do by looking at the records critically and trying to make associations by more than just a uh, identical or similar name. Yeah, you consider, for instance, that names aren't the only way people are identified. And this really gets to the crux of it, right? I mean, you could have a John Smith, but was he born in the same year as the other John Smith? And was his wife named Mary? And was he a hod carrier? And, you know, there are just so many little things that can help you separate out your person from the other person. But it can get very complicated. Yes, absolutely. Like in the U.S. Census, what is their birthplace there? And because you even have times, you know, like in church records, I'm a, I'm a German specialist, and we use the church records a lot. And I saw an example once of where a man ended up having four wives, because as was common in the late Middle Ages, you know, a lot of women died in childbirth. Right. And each time he married a woman named Katharina. Oh, no. <laughs> and, 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 and the researcher who was showing this example was saying, you might be tempted to think that all of these children are of the man and his wife, Katharina. Well, they are. But, you know, several were by the first wife, then by the second wife. And you can have some misattributed mother's names if you don't watch it. 
Yeah, it happens all the time, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. And really, what I find in all these circumstances is you want to ditch what I call presentism. In other words, you want to fight against that. Put yourself in the time period of your particular ancestors that you are researching and, you know, look for what are the naming patterns, what are the occupations, what records are even available in that particular time and in that particular place. And what was the place at the time? Was that in the same county at the time? The borders often change, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at least here in America, we have what I would call a linear political history as far as political units. In other words, new states were created, counties were created in those states, then new counties were formed from the previous counties and and so forth. In Germany, it's a nonlinear history because you had all these small little principalities and duchies, and they would fight. One would take over the other, or one's noble lineage of their rulers would die out, and it would be split in two by two other noble, wow. noble dynasties. <laughs> so you have a you have a lot again of the the history of that time of your ancestor that uh, you have to account for. Really, you can't do it as easily, I would think, in places like that as you can in the United States. So that's the good news, right? We have an advantage, at least in this country, when it comes to sorting these people out. Yeah, we have to study the history. But at least if we do that, like I say, we know it's kind of regular and, and linear with, with some very few exceptions. And that even even if you have the occasional ancestor that may not have moved at all, but new counties were created for where his residence was, that there may be records in several different counties, you can at least go back through that linear history to say, okay, before such and such date, it's going to be back to the mother county of that particular uh, place. Yeah, mother counties, daughter counties, that's when it gets a little bit complex, but you, you can have records of the same person in the same place in two different county archives now, right? Two or more. Or Two more. Or more. Yeah. Yeah, depending on how rapidly new counties were created. Yep. Wow. So what was the most complicated case you've run into personally? Oh, gosh. I guess in a county not too far away from me is Lebanon County, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And its county lineage for Pennsylvania was created relatively late, 1813, because, of course, we have have a a pretty long colonial history. But prior to that point, for only about a generation, about 30 years, it was part of Dauphin County, uh, which had been founded in 1785. Then for about two generations, it was part of Lancaster County. Lancaster County, County. that's right. In fact, I'm working on a case like this right now Uh, in that very place. uh Uh-huh. And that was created 1729. You go back to the very, very first settlers of what is now Lebanon County, and they were taxed by Chester County. That was oh, the, one of the original counties of Pennsylvania. So this is between 1729 and, and 1813. So, you know, it w- would have to be someone with a pretty long life that they would have gone through all four counties in right. one life. But very, very common that you have people who stayed in in what's now the Lebanon County area for two generations. And, yes, you'll find records of them in four different county courthouses. Oh, my gosh. That would drive (laughs) me nuts. And and I can see why a lot of people would just give up on it, right? Yeah, give up and sometimes falsely give up because they're thinking, you know, if they're doing some sort of database search that, you know, oh, I don't see any uh, records of them prior to uh, 1785 in Dauphin County. And, well, it's just because that's when that county was created and that the records for that area will be in Lancaster. And if you don't know the history, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Have you ever seen an occasion, by the way, where a daughter county inherited the records of the mother county when they've split off? That's a that's a very rare thing. Now, what is typical is on uh, as far as repositories like a county historical society, they will generally collect abstracts and transcripts of records dealing not just with their own county but also the mother county. The so mother you have county. that, but the courthouses 
just, I, I don't want to say never, but just about always the records created by the Mother County stay with the Mother County, mm -hmm. and it's just the daughter just starts court records fresh. Well, you know, it sounds like the archives are really where some of the bigger problems lie, right? Because of the fact that they collect from the Mother County and share it there, and, and some stuff would be left with the local historical societies in the Mother County. So you have to look at both, maybe, for the same time period. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, because while while the daughter county will will try to have a working collection of records relating to the mother county, they won't have as many details usually as a repository in that mother county would have. Yeah, that's a good point. So to go through this one more time, if if you've got somebody with a very common name or just multiple names in the same area, you have to sort them out in different ways. It's either going to be by age or by who they're married to or by their occupation or where they lived or the names of their children or the names. Of, I mean, there's so many different ways you can sort it out. Just remember that the identity of an individual is not just by the name. And that's how you can sort it out. And also, land records would be excellent for this, wouldn't they, Jim? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you, you ticked off all the highlights, and I would just make one additional suggestion that a way to try to do this is to put together a chronology, a timeline, yes. where, where you lay out your ancestor from birth to death with the other uh, highlights in between, like marriage, like buying land, births of children, and then see if it all fits together. And, you know, there, there are obvious clues, like if you have what appear to be children born three months apart, okay, now obviously you have two couples of the same identical names that you have to account for. Yeah, <laughs> that's when it gets really <laughs> tricky. He's Jim Beidler. He's a research reports editor with our friends over at LegacyTree.com. He's out of Pennsylvania. Thanks so much, Jim, for the expertise. It is a, a common problem for so many people who get into their family history and try to sort out those common names. I appreciate your coming on. And we got a lot of ground to cover the rest of this show. Coming up next, I'm going to talk to a woman in Salt Lake City, Utah, who discovered that her third great-grandfather was a killer for hire. In fact, the very first one in New York State. And a future president of the United States actually weighed in on his case. You're going to want to hear all the details of that. It's coming up for you in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Hey, 
Welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. This segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. And it was a fascinating luncheon a while back where I got to meet my next guest. Her name is Kathy Hudson. And Kathy had a story I don't think I've heard from anybody before. And her uh, tale of discovery was quite fascinating. Kathy, you know, it's not a lot of people who really want to look for hired killers. But but you, I mean, you really dug in to get the details on this. Was this a story that was long in your family? No, not at all. No one knew about it. And I'm sure that my poor grandmother is rolling in a grave. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she, was, she was such a proper woman. Yes. You know, but it is what it is. As opposed and, to her grandfather or something like that. What's the guy's name and where was he from? What era are we talking about? Uh, his name was David Dunning. Okay. He lived in Orange County, New York. Okay. Upstate, yeah. Yeah, and I don't have very many real records on him. I, I don't know exactly when he was born. Guesstimated from the one census record I found of him, he was born between 1785 and 1792. Okay, so he was an adult then in the, like the 18 teens, and he is said to be like the first contract killer in the history of New York, right? <laughs> Right. I didn't say it. Martin Van Buren did. Martin Van Buren said it. it. What was his role there? He, at that time, was the attorney general for the state of New York. Wow. And he was assisting with this trial. It was the first murder trial in 30 years in Orange County. And I was astounded. I, I had no idea. I found the name under Orange County, the name David Dunning, and I thought, oh, that's kind of curious. That's, <laughs> that's my, my guy. grandmother's. Yeah, that's your guy, right? And, and so what was he well, accused of doing? Okay, the details were he was a young man with a wife and a child about eight or nine years old. He was a farm laborer. He got a job with a man named James Teed on his farm, and he went there about April of 1818. Now, Teed had this contentious relationship with his uncle. His uncle was Richard Jennings. Okay. Teed felt that Jennings was trying to swindle him out of his land that his father had left him. It was a 50-acre plot of land, and they had been to court about it many times. It really stuck in James Teed's craw. He just hated his uncle. He got together with his wife, his brother-in-law, David Dunning, and another man named Hodges, and they conspired to kill Jennings. Wow. Yeah. Why would David Dunning be a part of this? Because, I mean, he wasn't a member of the family. He was just renting there, right? Yeah. He was offered $1,000. Oh, 1000 bucks back and then, 200 years ago. Uh, that, that's worth a lot of money today. It was about $16,250 plus. I, I worked it out on the inflation calculator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a chunk of change. That's a chunk it's of like change. It's like a new yeah. car. Exactly. Yeah. So whether they were fired up by Teed's arguments about his right to the land or what a horrible man this guy was, or perhaps just the money, they decided to do it. So it was determined that David Dunning and Jack Hodges would do the actual deed. They lived near each other, you know, out in the country. So in December, it was December 21st, they followed Jennings as he passed Deed's house on his way to cut firewood. They shot him and beat him until he died. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty severe. The body wasn't found for five or six days, and once the body was found, things happened very quickly. Yeah. So did he yeah. plead guilty or innocent? Well, he was found guilty. I think he pleaded innocent. And he kept telling them right up until the time they hanged him that he was innocent, that he didn't do it, that the other guy, Jack Hodges, did it. But for some reason, they believed Hodges more than they believed Dunning. And in the end, Hodges went to jail for a while, but then they let him out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Goes on his yeah. merry way. When they let him out, they built a statue to him. <laughs> what? Who did? Yes. Who did? The people who lived in... Um, now, all this took place on the eastern part of New York. Yeah. But he went to jail in Canandaigua, which is in Ontario County. The people in Canandaigua erected a statue to him. 
Because what? I'm, I'm not making this up. I know. It's it sounds the- like. <laughs> why would they do that? Because he was reformed and he became a Christian, and I'm not exactly sure what he did. But it's in this book written by Michael Warden. It's called The Murder of Richard Jennings, The True Story of New York's first murder for hire. So you were familiar with the name of David Dunning then in your family tree, and then ultimately you you ran into this where? Well, I wasn't really familiar with the name from what my aunt had given me, but I found it in the Gazetteer of New York. And then I found his son, Louis. My aunt had gone to where the family had settled after they left Orange County and took pictures of the gravestones of men that she knew to be her grandfather's brothers. Right. And on the gravestones, they had carved in the names of the parents. Nice. Yeah, which is, yeah, very nice. Really helpful. Yeah, that's what I thought. So from that, I was able to trace the son, Louis. And then when I found out that there was a murder trial, I contacted people in Orange County at the Historical Society, And a man named Kenneth Dunning, we haven't figured out if we're related or not, was kind enough to copy the entire trial transcript for me. Oh, wow. And so the names all started to come together and you realized, oh, this is my guy. (laughs) Yeah, because Lewis was named as the son of David in the trial. So how far back does David go? What's your relationship to him? He's my third grade grandfather. Third grade. Okay. And so he was the first contract killer in the history of New York State. (laughs) That's what Martin Van Buren said. Yeah. And you got a future president involved in the trial and you got a book written about it. That is a pretty decent find. Yeah. But none of them have the one thing I want to know. Which is? Which is the parent of David Dunning. Oh, Okay, yeah. looking to push I mean, that I'd back. Like, I mean, that's, that's what all genealogists want to do. They want to go back as far as they possibly can. A little bit more, and, yep. But the thing is, in the first reading the trial transcript, and then talking with the man that wrote the book, Mike Warden, he found me online on one of the Dunning websites on RootsWeb or something, contacted me, and I shared some information with him. A lot of, a lot of what I had was just rumor. And Mike, a former New York City police officer and detective, had disproven a lot of it. The book he wrote is really fascinating. He started out to do other crime stories, but he ended up getting really involved in this one particular trial. So he has a lot of information on what happened then. What's your family's reaction been to all this? Well, my father's three sisters are much like their mother, from what I can remember, very <laughs> proper uh-huh. ladies, church going. Well, they don't want to hear about this. Do they deny it well, or just ignore it? Well, you know, it's I'm the family historian. I'm the one that's really interested in it. And they've helped me. They've helped me a lot. But they're not as addicted to it as I am. They're happy that I found this stuff. I found other stuff, of course, too. You know, like our Mayflower connection. Yeah, our AD, the good AW stuff. Connection. Right, yeah. They like that stuff a lot more. They don't like the one that... <laughs> Not like Catholic. this guy. She's Kathy Hudson from Salt Lake City, Utah. Kathy, thanks so much for sharing your story and how you found it. And uh, good luck in the future. Okay, thank you. And coming up next in three minutes, why would you worry so much about passwords for sites that store your photographs? What do you care if somebody steals your photo or sees them? You'll find out why with Tom Perry, our preservation authority, coming up next on Extreme Genes. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us 
toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Ever wonder where you got your bright green eyes or your infectious laugh? Thanks to technology, discovering your family story has never been easier. And we're bringing it all together at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Registration for Roots Tech 2019 is open. Join us February 27th through March 2nd for this incredible four-day event at the Salt Palace Convention Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. For a limited time, take advantage of promotional pricing. Purchase a four-day pass for only $209 if you register before January 25th. That's $90 off a regularly priced pass. Explore over 200 exhibits in the Expo Hall and interact with the latest technology. Join the excitement, join the fun. Discover your family, discover yourself. Discover Roots Tech, February 27th through March 2nd at the Salt Palace Convention Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. Register today at rootstech.org. Hey, Genies, Fisher here with a shout out to our Patrons Club members at patreon.com slash extreme genes. This is where friends of the show support extreme genes for as little as a dollar a month all the way up to the cost of a very nice burger each month. I mean, a really juicy one. You can support the show and enjoy various special Patrons Club member benefits, such as acknowledgement on ExtremeGenes.com, special bonus podcasts from expert guests like Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, C.C. Moore, your genetic genealogist, great storytellers and experts on record sets from all over the world. We even offer expert advice on specific questions challenging your research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. We love sharing your genealogical journey with you on our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. After all, what would you rather have, inspiring and informative content or another greasy burger? The choice is yours. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. Hey, back at it, talking preservation with our preservation authority, Tom Perry, on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here. Tom, you've been uh, hearing a lot of talk lately about people getting a little laxed on passwords. And this is really interesting, I think, what you have to say about passwords and photo sites. Oh, absolutely. People think, oh, these are just photos. Who wants to hack them? And if they want to steal them, who cares? I don't care. The thing is, that's not the end of the problem. People can actually go into your files, get into a photo, and they can put a virus in a photo. You're not going to open an email you don't understand, but a photo, if they put a virus in your photo and you don't know it, and you click on Aunt Martha and it opens up your email automatically or goes to a website automatically, downloads things that you don't even know what it's doing, or they hide kind of in limbo and they wait till late at night and your computer's still on, and then they do all their dirty work, and now you've got a virus, or even worse, they can hold all your photos, they can hold your entire computer hostage and say, hey, you have to pay me this amount of money and I'll give you the password to get back into your computer. Oh, I don't like the sound of that at all, but you're absolutely right. That's true. And you know, it's interesting when you get into password security. And I spent a whole weekend on this earlier this year because I'd had a problem. And I came to realize that if you use the same password and they hack that password at one site, then they start looking for that same password that might be associated with your username or your name on other sites. And that's how they get access. So if you're going to do the job right, you really need to go in and create a complicated password and a unique password for every site in which you're involved and people think oh i got so many passwords how can i do that i have the perfect solution here on extreme genes all right okay let me give you an example let's say that you have a boston terrier and your boston terrier's name is dorothy so you write on your computer or any place that it's going to be right in front of you you write down the name dorothy lowercase d-o-r-t-h in a capital Y and an exclamation point. And you can put that in plain sight because nobody's going to know what it means. But actually, what that D-O-R-T-H-Y exclamation point means, you actually, your password is Boston 
terrier with a capital R at the end, and then the exclamation point. So nobody's going to know that except for you. Right. So if you keep a list, and we have to keep a list if you're going to have unique passwords on every site you're involved with, you want to keep it more cryptic. Okay, so what you're going to do, you already know now your password is Boston Terrier with the capital R at the end, and then an exclamation point or a question mark. Now, all your banking things, you add P-I-N to the end. So if your PIN number to your bank accounts are 1234, now you have Boston Terrier with a capital R, question mark, and then 1234. If you have an account on Skype, same thing, Boston Terrier, question mark, then S-K-Y-P with a capital E. Facebook, Boston Terrier, capital R, exclamation point, Facebook, capital K. So wherever you go, you're going to know the code. Nobody else is going to have any clue what that means if it's written right in plain sight. Right. And we should mention, by the way, don't ever use 1234 as a password or pin on anything because it's the most (laughs) simple thing in the world to solve. Absolutely. I mean, you really do have to think about it. I do like to use ancestral information for my passwords because to me, working in genealogy all the time, these are really easy for me to remember. I remember birth dates, birth years, death years, marriage years, or something significant that took place in some ancestor's life. There are associations perhaps that my people belong to and I can put those all together and create unique passwords for every site as well and it's made a lot of difference I haven't had a problem since I started doing this and I think it's something that everybody should look into and why not start with your genealogical sites all right coming up next Tom we're going to talk about storage because a lot of people are worrying about this as they get more and more information regarding (laughs) DNA and family histories and all kinds of data we'll get into that Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. Hey, 
Hey, we are back for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this segment is brought to you by Legacy Tree Genealogists. And I'm talking to Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. And uh, Tom, as we get closer to the holidays, people are doing more scanning. They've got more photographs. Maybe they have been converting old family movies, home movies, and videos to digital. And that means storage is becoming more of an issue again. And this is a great thing to cover one more time. Exactly. In fact, I always tell people in our store or on the show or on our Facebook page, I always tell them, okay, you want to store things, you want to do it in at least one cloud, two clouds unrelated if you can. You want to have it on a hard disk. You want to have a physical thing like a disk and then like a USB drive and also someplace on your computer and spread them out. Yep. And if you do it that way, you're always going to be covered. Yeah, and I like the physical side of it, too, because I know Tayo Uden discs work very well. Everything you've ever converted for me is still solid years later. I don't have to worry about it, especially if I keep it out of sunlight and in a place that's dark. Exactly. That's exactly how you want to store it. And one thing that's getting bigger and bigger because the prices are dropping is Blu-ray. Blu-ray is probably one of the best and the greatest way to store stuff. And we're not talking about a Blu-ray movie or a Blu-ray video. We're talking about a Blu-ray disc, as you would think of a box to store stuff in. So you can get like Blu-ray discs that are like 25 gigabytes. You can get 10 of them for 12 bucks, or you can get 50 gigabyte ones. You can get 10 for 30 bucks. Wow. And I prefer smaller ones. Because it's more efficient that way? Right. If you have one disc that's got 50 gigs and you have a problem, you've lost 50 gigs, and it's more expensive. I would rather have two 25 gigabyte Blu-ray discs than 150 because it's just easier to manipulate and send around. And another thing with, as you mentioned, the holidays coming up, this is a perfect way, if you're the genealogy person in your family, the family historian in your family, get all this stuff together, burn a Blu-ray disc for everybody, and send them out as gifts. And if somebody doesn't have a Blu-ray disc, tell them to go to (laughs) Amazon, and they can buy one for like 50 bucks. It's just an external one. It plugs into any USB drive, so whether they have a laptop or whatever, they have a Blu-ray player now and a Blu-ray burner, and they're going to be all set. And this is by far the best way to store things. Like as you mentioned, you have something physical to hold in your hand. You can ship them all over the world. Yeah, really good point. The other thing that I've noticed since we started this show back in 2013 is that thumb drives now are much more efficient, much more quality, and and have a lot more storage space than they've ever had before. Oh, that is so true. In the old days, they were so flaky. You were scared about getting bad ones. Most of them are pretty good now. One thing you want to be sure, no matter whose you buy, you want ones that have a cover that goes on the end because if you have the ends that are exposed and it's in your pocket or just gets dust and things on it, not only could it corrupt your USB drive or your thumb drive, you plug it in your computer and you could be transferring dirt or sand or dust or anything to your computer. So make sure it's the kind that retracts with a little door on it or it has a cover go on it. And for instance, you can buy a 64 gigabyte one for about $13. You can get 128 gigabytes for $25. But just make sure you store it properly. The other thing about it is, make sure, by the way, when you use these thumb drives, that you're really thinking of them as temporary transportation. You know, you're going to a library someplace, an archive someplace, you're storing information, and you're bringing it home, because you could easily lose a little thumb drive like that. Oh, yes. We've had many customers call us that went through the washer or went through the dryer or something like that, and that's devastating. Very rarely do they survive that. All right. Great stuff, Tom. Always good to talk to you, and we'll catch up again next week. My pleasure. Hey, we've covered a lot of ground, just like we said we would, and talk about some great stories, especially from Kathy Hudson from Salt Lake City, Utah, talking about her ancestor who was a killer for hire in the 18-teens in New York. If you missed any of it, catch the podcast. You can find it on Extreme Genes, iHeartRadio, and, of course, iTunes. We will talk to you again next week. Thanks so much for joining us, and remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 